Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Michael Hirsch with another episode of Stay Connected with the Worcester Senior Center. Really glad to be here in the merry month of April. What do they say in the songs of uh, Simon and Garfunkel? April, come she will. Um, this is our first real full month of spring. And uh, it's a very interesting month historically. Um, April, the word April comes from the Latin word apriori, which means opening up. And that's kind of what conceptually April is kind of about. The, the buds on the trees open up, the flowers open up. Um, spring has always been looked at, even from the very, very early times of uh, primitive man, as a reawakening of the earth because everything turns green after the long, dark winter. As a matter of fact, the old calendar had April as the first month of the year. But in the 1590s, most of Europe switched over to the Julian calendar, and it switched so that January became the first month of the year. But there were some diehards that didn't want to switch. They liked the idea of beginning of spring being the beginning of the year and they kind of lagged behind everybody else making the switch and guess what people called those folk april fools and that's how we get our april fools day april 1st is the day that you're allowed to play some practical jokes by the way i hate that <laughs> i hate practical jokes i'm always the very gullible victim of practical jokes both my children and my wife have played many a practical joke on me, and I, I never detected it. So uh, anyway, uh, that's how we get April Fools. And as April progresses, yes, there are showers, and the showers will bring more flowers in May. Uh, but it can be kind of depressing in, in parts of New England where it's a little more, bit more mountainous and cold. Uh, all of the snows melt and come down from the mountains and many people call April mud season and it gets a little bit depressing sometimes. Uh, we don't have quite as much of that mud season here in Worcester, but when you're really looking forward to the sun shining and you know just being able to be out all the time and it's raining, it can get you a little down. But just think of it this way. So many things are happening in April. It's, it's a delight, right? We have religious holidays that celebrate uh, the rebirth of the earth and uh, recommitment to our you know, religious beliefs. Easter and Passover are kind of both in that realm. And um, it's a wonderful time to get together with family. And whether you're searching for hidden matzah, which we do in the Jewish religion, or if you're searching for lost Easter eggs. The idea is still it's family time and a time for the young people to realize what a glorious thing it is to watch things reborn. Um, also, we've got baseball. We've got baseball all over the place. Uh, you know, opening day this year is March 31st, actually, but um, the Woo Sox will be uh, opening on that day, and it's uh, it's just great to have a, a team like the Woo Sox here in town. How how happy am I? I'm just like the biggest baseball fan ever, and um, I'm going to try to be there on opening day. I think it's a way of supporting uh, the Woo Sox organization, but the city too. And um, it's it's a wonderful time for us to kind of support our guys, uh, the Red Sox, and. Fenway are going to have a tough year this year. They're probably going to be calling on a lot of our Woo Sox players if they're having a good season to come on up to the majors. And that's kind of exciting when you follow one of these minor leaguers that actually makes an impact on a major league season. Um, and you can say, oh, I knew him when he was playing in the Woo. The Woo has had a big uh, history in baseball. Um, it was one of the earliest teams in the National League um, from 1880 to 1882. 
we were really one of the premier teams in the National League. We had the first no-hitter pitched here. We also were the first team to be no-hit here in Worcester. But unfortunately, we couldn't sustain enough attendance to uh, maintain our place in the National League. So they moved our team from Worcester to Philly, and that's where the Philadelphia Phillies were born. On the last day of our last season, our third season here, the Worcester Worcesters, maybe it was the name that wasn't so good. They were also called the Worcester Brown Stockings. Um, had such a low attendance, it's still the lowest attendance of any recorded major league game. Six people showed up. So uh, the team outnumbered <laughs> the uh, people in the, feet and the uh, audience um, by a factor of about two. So anyway, uh, but Worcester has now got this great stadium and all around the stadium there's new life too. You're seeing hotels going up and garages going up and restaurants going up. And I think within the next five years, that whole canal district attaching down towards the baseball area is going to be transformed into kind of like the same feeling you get walking around Fenway with Yawkey Way and everything. So, you know, with all of these great things happening, and I bet the only thing I can think of that's a negative for April is tax day, April 15th. But, you know, we, we live in a great country. We have to support it with our hard-earned money. And I think the investment is, is worth it. You know, that's what the great management people always talk about, ROI, return on investment. I think the return on investment is still pretty good when you pay your taxes. Um, but with all that good stuff going on, except for tax day, uh, what can I possibly talk to you about? I usually am talking about all these health dangers and everything else. So I have some stuff, serious stuff to talk about. But I wanted to kind of preface my remarks by making you feel good about April coming. It's an opening up. So what am I going to tell you about? Well, one thing is with a lot of rain, uh, you get gullies and culverts and little puddles and uh, streams and ponds that overflow and they can come they can become the breeding ground for mosquitoes so if you have that kind of uh, landscape in where you live uh, you should try your best to see if you can get rid of buckets lying around garbage cans old tires things where that standing water can become a home for larvae for these mosquitoes, which we expect to be quite numerous this year because the winter was so mild, right? We didn't really have nearly the snowfalls that we see. And that will also create a good opportunity for ticks. The ticks didn't really have as much hard frost time, so we expect that they're going to be pretty active as well. So you have to watch out for your dogs. A lot of you, I know, are taking advantage of the parks and the dog parks in Worcester. And uh, you really got to inspect your dog and make sure that they're not carrying these ticks because it doesn't affect just your dog. It affects you too. If you get a tick bite, it can become a serious problem if it ends up transmitting any one of a bunch of different uh, tick-borne diseases. We, we mostly associate it with Lyme's disease, but there's another few. Uh, babiosis is one of them. Um, and that's been increasing in the area. They all cause this kind of f uh, fever, achy, joint pain kind of thing. Sometimes, though, they can actually go on and, and cause more serious infections. So if you can avoid ticks, you know, the best way is making sure if you're taking strolls in forests or, or in wooded areas or high grass where, you know, socks that go high and up up on your calf and wear your um, pants down low. Sometimes you can figure out a way of tucking your pants into your socks. Those are all ways that you can avoid having the uh, ticks take a hitchhike on you. Um, and that'll help 
with uh, with the transmission of these these kind of diseases. And then we always talk about the five D's of protecting yourself against mosquitoes, right? One is uh, avoid being out during dawn and dusk. That's when the mosquitoes love to be out there with you. Uh, when you dress, you want to dress with long sleeves and long pants if possible. Um, you you want to drain any of those standing water things like I mentioned. And then, of course, the insect repellent of choice should have the element called DEET in it, D-E-E-T. That's not DDT, for those of you old enough like me to remember the pesticides that were used in the 50s and 60s, DDT was a bad one because it had some uh, cancer producing side effects. DEET has none of that. And if you can use a solution or you lose a spray and it's uh, more than 15 to 25 percent, you're, you're good. Some, some, you can get a, a solution that is like 90 percent DEET. And, um, and those are good in that you can go swimming and then it doesn't uh, fade off, you know, after you go in for one immersion. So the other thing that we should talk about in, in the, um, the month of April is maybe you start thinking about, maybe I should start going to the Y and, and get into a pool. Uh, you'll be reading a lot in the next, uh, I would say, month about a new citywide uh, effort to teach our uh, youth how to swim and how to teach uh, camp counselors, lifeguards, city employees, uh, camp counselors uh, to know how to do CPR. You know, that's the cardiopulmonary resuscitation where you're pushing on the uh, chest of a patient. Um, so if someone is a drowning victim and gets pulled out by, by a lifeguard or if someone is found down, unconscious. Um, there's some steps that we have to do, but I think many of you probably grew up in a time when you knew about CPR, but uh, you had to use both your hands on the chest and also put your mouth down on their mouth and do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Except for drowning and except for an obvious uh, episode of choking that someone has witnessed, we don't have to do the mouth-to-mouth -mouth anymore. It's just the hands-on uh, pressure. And this campaign that we're going to be launching with UMass and, um, and several uh, other organizations, including a foundation that um, is dedicated after the uh, memory of uh, Officer Familia, who was that brave police officer who died while trying to save a, a youth who had... Uh, uh, gone into Green Hill Pond and, and drowned. And he, and so he himself drowned in that effort. So his family, led by his um, brother Elvin, have started up a uh, foundation and they're helping to support this citywide effort. Um, the stats are kind of uh, shocking in that in uh, eastern Massachusetts, if you... Uh, uh, suffer an episode of sudden death, like what we saw in that famous uh, football player, uh, Daryl Hamlin, from the Buffalo Bills in the in playoff game against the Cincinnati Bengals. He got hit just at the right spot in the right time of his heart beat, and that made his heart stop. But it was great quick work by the sideline doctors of both teams to resuscitate him with CPR, and he survived. And he's been looking great. He's been making lots of public appearances, and that's wonderful. So that kind of finding a person down on the street like that, in eastern Massachusetts, you have a 10% survival of, uh, as, as far as uh, statistics go, 10% 10, 10 survival rate. Here in central Massachusetts, it's only 2%. And most of that is because of lack of knowledge about this CPR technique. So we're going to increase that knowledge and hopefully we will get our numbers up. There are regions of the country uh, like Washington State in the areas around Seattle, 
and Tacoma that have survival rates of like 60% because they've been teaching CPR from school age times all the way up into geriatric times. And so there's very few people in that state that haven't been exposed to the instruction and they have a very high survival rate. So we should be aiming at that. This is like low hanging fruit in public health. And I'm hoping you'll hear a lot more about it on uh, social media and our websites and, and uh, also the city manager and the mayor have been very uh, aggressively behind this. So you'll hear, you'll hear more about this uh, new CPR campaign. Um, so uh, what else can we talk about about the month of April that's kind of um, unique? Uh, I think that from the standpoint of other worrisome things from public health, the, the one thing I would say is anytime the weather does get nicer, that becomes the beginning of trauma season. Uh, so what is trauma season? Well, for kids, it's kids get out there, they're on their bikes, they're at the playground, they're playing basketball, they're driving cars sometimes, uh, and that just makes them much more exposed. So from the months really from May until September, that's what the pediatric trauma season is. And it takes a lot of uh, preparation, and uh, if you're smart, uh, sit down talks with the kids about what's a safe way to walk to the park, what's a safe way to get to school, uh, the rules of the road, if you're driving a car, if you're riding a bike, um, wearing the right equipment like helmets if you're riding a bike, all those things go into um, a healthy outcome. A little bit of preparation in the beginning. Uh, as far as adults, where are adults getting into trouble with trauma season? Well, this is the time that you see people doing their spring garden cleanup. They're up on ladders. They're trying to clean out gutters. Maybe there's a squirrel that nested up in your attic and you're trying to get it out through the hole that they made or you're trying to plug the hole that they made. Please, if you have... Um, comorbidities, meaning other medical illnesses, like you're on blood pressure medicine or you're diabetic, all these things can make your blood pressure vary from minute to minute. If you're quickly changing positions, if you're climbing up on a ladder like that, you can lose your balance, you can you know, kind of get a little dizzy, and the next thing you know, you're in the trauma center from a fall off a ladder with some broken bones. And if you're on the other kind of medications like blood thinners and stuff, this is all very serious business. So you have to just, you know, know your limitations. And, um, you know, I think if you can afford to have somebody help you with some of your cleanup stuff in the, in the yard, do that. Um, or ask, you know, maybe your young grandkids or your, you know, kids themselves to help you with that. So you don't take it on at an age where, you know, one little wrong move can be a very consequential one. So that's, uh, you know, traumas, Trauma Awareness Month is May. So I'll talk about this more in May. But I think that uh, it's important to at least prepare yourself that your uh, families are a little bit more at risk the more they do outside. We want you to be outside. We don't want people just sitting around. We don't want the little kids to just be sitting, staring at, you know, sit, uh, Xbox and, and other, you know, video games. We want them outside. Uh, but at the same time, we got to be that kind of elder generation that looks out for them. And um, that's some of the things that you can do in advance is to, to talk them down when they are planning crazy activities. And you never know. Sometimes when I drive around between UMass Memorial Lakeside and UMass Memorial uh, Belmont Street, I'm just amazed at the kind of stuff that the kids are doing on, their, on that hill. A very steep hill, cars are going way too fast. Um, they're not necessarily obeying 
the crosswalks and the warning signs near Bell Hill School. And it's, it's really quite miraculous that more crashes don't occur there. We've had over the years bicycle riders that were run down there. We've had kids, uh, pedestrians hit. And it's made worse by the fact that a lot of the pedestrians now are just as distracted as the drivers. The drivers are texting and driving, and that's bad. But the pedestrians are texting and not looking around as they cross the crosswalk too. So got to be, uh, uh, I think, you know, figuring out that it's most important to get from A to B. And during that time, maybe you just put your phone away. If you're not getting a telephone call, why not just take that time to take some deep breaths, take a look around, look all the, at the budding flowers and the, the birds that are probably right in front of your eyes and you didn't even see them. Um, you know, it, uh, it's good to disconnect a little bit and just take all this stuff in. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful time, as we said. It's a time for renewal. It's a time for uh, everything opening up again. The, the Romans were right. It is an, a time for opening up. So uh, one of the last things I'm going to talk about for April is... Uh, it's a very important month for me personally. It's not a holiday that anybody uh, else, I don't think, is, uh, is um, celebrating. And I may have told you this story before. I, I can't remember. But if I have, you can turn me off now after you listen a little bit. And if I haven't, maybe you'll find it interesting. Um, if you go back to April of 1945, um, I wasn't here then, but my parents were, and they were both in a concentration camp in Holland, and they had been there uh, for the better part of five years, um, and uh, my dad was uh, spared from being sent to Poland, to Auschwitz, because he had been trained to operate farm machinery. He was a city boy, kind of like me, didn't know much about that stuff, but he got trained to, to work these machines and that helped to uh, run the prison farm. And um, he was able to do some negotiations on the periphery of this uh, concentration camp. And locals would come and uh, offer things, sometimes food, uh, but he scored a little shortwave radio uh, from one of these locals, and they were listening every night. They hid underneath the barracks um, and listened to the BBC to figure out, like, what was going on with the war. And uh, they heard that the, you know, the Germans were in retreat in Holland, but nobody had gotten to them yet. Uh, but they had a feeling that something was going on because they could hear in the distance artillery fire and they heard lots of planes going around. And then on um, April 11th of 1945, uh, all the guards for the camp, all the German personnel fled. They left the prisoners locked in um, but there was nobody around to police them anymore. And then the morning of April 12th, um, a column of tanks started rolling down the road that led to the gates of the camp. And they had the insignia of the Maple Leaf. It was the Canadian Army 2nd Division uh, coming to liberate the camp. Um, they busted down the gate just by, you know, running a tank right through it. And all of the people that were left, now there were only 800 um, people left in the camp. At one point there were 220,000. Um, well, the folks that were there lined up kind of on either side of what was called the Boulevard of Misery because it led from the front of the camp to the train station, 
that was connected directly to Auschwitz. So people came out of the barracks when they found out they had been chosen to go on those transports to Auschwitz. It was called the Boulevard of Misery because everybody, as you might imagine, was crying. My father lined up with a bunch of his friends. Um, the tanks kind of opened up their tops and uh, the Canadian tankers were sticking their heads out of the various portals and they were all crying. And um, my, my, friend, my dad's friend said, gee, do we look so bad? Uh, and my dad said, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe we do. They, they did look pretty bad. It had just been the winter of hunger. Uh, the winter between 44 and 45 was the, one of the worst weather winters in European history. And the Germans had taken all of the food all over Holland to feed their army. There was no food for the Dutch. And forget about the Dutch Jews. No way. So uh, finally, I think one or two of the guys uh, who were the prisoners went up and talked to the tankers and found out that the reason they were all crying was that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had just passed away uh, and they'd gotten the news on the on their radios and you know he was even though they were Canadian I mean he was such an iconic figure of a tower of strength kind of guy overcoming his uh, polio problem and uh, it was very emotional for them so on the spot my my dad changed his name and adopted the name of Franklin because uh, he was very grateful. He didn't know that whether his parents were alive or not, uh, but he, he knew that America was the place he wanted to go if he ever got out of camp. And he also knew that uh, if it hadn't been for America, Europe would never have been freed. So uh, April 12th in my family was always a big day. The uh, official color for uh, Holland is orange. Uh, the House of Orange was where their uh, line of monarchy came. So every year, once I got old enough, I'd go out and get myself some kind of orange flower. If I could get a tulip, that was big because, you know, the, the Dutch are the big tulip manufacturers or, or cultivators. But sometimes I just got, you know, carnations or Whatever I could get, I always gave a, you know, a bouquet to my dad and mom, and we had a little toast for Liberation Day. And uh, it was a new beginning for them, uh, just like everything else we've been talking about in April. Um, opening up that gate led them to a life together in America. Got me my start <laughs> in America, for sure. And... Um, I, I'm always saying to anyone who'll listen that um, I'm very lucky and I'm very appreciative to our armed forces and the Canadian armed forces for everything they did to uh, help save my parents. So um, I think April is, an, is a month that is underappreciated. You know, everybody kind of leans towards the summer. If they're summer people, they like the warmth. So July and August, awesome. Uh, and April is a little rainy, so maybe May gets the Merry Month title. But I, I, I really do love April. And I think that we have good things happening here now that the pandemic is in the rearview mirror. Um, COVID will be around us, but in a way that will cause some inconvenience, but hopefully not serious hospitalizations and death. I would still recommend that you stay up to date on vaccinations. I will give you updates when new vaccines are here, but if you haven't yet taken uh, advantage of the bivalent uh, booster, please do that. You don't have to take any other booster from your original vaccinations. Take that one. It's been shown to be very, very effective. The only patients now that are dying of COVID are people who were not vaccinated or under-vaccinated. Um, 
So as much as everyone makes a big thing about, oh, you know, the native immunity that you get from getting COVID is, uh, you know, better than uh, the vaccine, it's, it's not been shown to be true. That vaccine is very, very good. And it may also have suppressed the flu this year. We're not 100% sure that's being studied. It revs up your immune system to the point where it can fight a lot of foes at once. Um, so um, that's really all I have to say about April. You know a lot about how I love April. I hope that you will have a wonderful month and uh, keep watching us on the uh, Stay Connected program for the Worcester Senior Center. It's an honor to continue to be your host. I kind of asked the director of um, the Division of Public Health where I work, he's a new uh, person who re replaced our excellent director, Karen Clark. His name is Solo Dennis, and he'll be with me next month. You'll meet him, and we'll talk a little bit about priorities now that the pandemic is kind of dying down. Um, I asked him, you know, do you think I should still do this every month? And he said, well, the, the reviews are pretty good. From what I hear from the senior center, they like it. So I am grateful if that's the case. And if it's not the case, let us know. You can uh, dial into our website, www.worcesterma.gov, uh, and, <laughs> and say, I don't want to hear from Dr. Hirsch anymore. And I will say goodbye. But I'm very grateful for the opportunity of connecting with you this way. And uh, thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you next month.